Um, it's been, this is my third year at UMass. I arrived uh, under the specter of the, uh, the COVID pandemic in summer of uh, 2020. And so I feel like this is the first real, this is like my introduction to the, the, the LARP community uh, and to kind of UMass overall, it feels like. Um, and so it's uh, really nice to be here. I've met uh, uh, some faculty and students uh, so far here over the last couple of years, but I'm really looking forward to getting to know folks uh, in this community more. Because as you'll see, my work really, I think, fits in uh, well here. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we can find some spaces for discussion and uh, future collaborations. Um, and I used to actually be in an urban planning department back in Portland State. <laughs> now that was my first faculty job. Um, so it's good to be back in a uh, regional planning, landscape architecture environment. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about urban resilience, the relationship between infrastructure and our institutions, and how that inhibits or enhances uh, resilience. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about co-production with practitioners and communities and researchers and how that might uh, help um, uh, break up some of the, some of the path dependencies uh, that we're seeing. Um, and, and so this talk, you know, it's been a while since I've given a live talk uh, uh, like this. I've, I've done some on the, on the Zoom, uh, but this is a little different. Um, and what I'm trying to do here is um, I'm going to try to, to the best of my ability, synthesize uh, some lines of work I and collaborators have been doing for the past, you know, five to seven years. Um, and that's collaborators that are ecologists, engineers, urban planners, social scientists, practitioners. Um, and, and so hopefully it all works and is understandable. Um, and I'm uh, looking forward to hopefully a nice discussion as well. Um, but before I do that, I thought I'd just give a, a quick sense of who I am and where I'm coming from and how I think about this stuff as a sort of introductory uh, thing to see, you know, so we can talk about resilience, but maybe there's other things we can talk about as well. Um, and so a lot of my work is really focused on how can researchers and communities and planners and practitioners work together to advance urban sustainability. And I do that by thinking about and doing work on co-production, thinking about and doing work on uh, resilience of socio-eco-technical systems or sets, which I'll talk about later, um, and also uh, some work on uh, the governance of emerging technologies around smart cities and autonomous vehicles uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, but all in service of how do we think about sustainability um, and, and how do we navigate to, to more sustainable uh, outcomes. Um, and so a lot of the work I'm going to uh, talk about uh, today uh, has come uh, from a large project that we're uh, really officially wrapping up now, just all looked at the, the final report to the National Science Foundation that's been going on for about seven years, the Urban Resilience to Extremes Sustainability Research Network, which was supposed to be five years, but it kind of stressed just six or seven. Um, a $12 million project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, led by a team of ecologists, engineers, social scientists like myself, uh, working across nine cities in the US and Latin America, um, and working with practitioners and planners and communities in each of those cities, right? Um, and, and to, you know, we, there's, a lot, there's a lot we've learned about that type of collaboration, both interdisciplinary as well as transdisciplinary, working with communities uh, that I'm also happy to, happy to talk about. Um, and, and what we were trying to explore in, in this was, you know, how is it that our infrastructure, especially our urban inf infrastructure, is vulnerable uh, to extreme weather events? Um, and then how can that infrastructure uh, transition to more resilient, equitable, sustainable pathways? So looking at flooding, looking at heat, uh, looking at drought, uh, coastal flooding. Um, and, and there's a, just a few concepts that, we, you know, that, that I'll be mentioning uh, throughout the talk. Uh, that we, you know, were really the centerpiece of our work. Uh, one was this idea of sets or socio-eco-technical systems, which I think, into, just in terms of interdisciplinary collaboration, acted as kind of a boundary concept to have ecologists, planners, engineers, social scientists all be able to kind of be in the same room and work together uh, on something kind of providing an umbrella concept. Um, we also did work on uh, scenarios, uh, on not just climate scenarios, uh, but but desirable participatory sort of resilient future scenarios with communities uh, and practitioners across our nine cities. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, one we did in Portland. Uh, and then the other kind of centerpiece uh, of this project uh, was uh, knowledge co-production, right? Uh, that yes, certainly there's gonna be work that the researchers do together, 
but, but more importantly, the, the scenarios, uh, the other work that we do should be uh, in collaboration with practitioners, co-defining the actual research questions from the outset um, and, 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 and trying to support the work that practitioners and, and communities are doing. Um, and so lots of lessons learned from that that I don't necessarily dive into today, but, but happy to uh, talk about uh, more. Okay, so with all that uh, exposition uh, there, um, I'm gonna uh, get into a little more exposition on the Anthropocene and, and infrastructure. Um, to, to set up some of the some of the work we did in, in Portland, um, and so uh, you know the Anthropocene, somewhat of a of a of a divisive uh, concept among some. I'm just using it here as a as a shorthand uh, for for talking about the extent to which humans have come to dominate many of the uh, uh, many of our Earth systems, from biodiversity to water to increasingly uh, temperature uh, and, and climate. Um, and, and so others might, you know, uh, quibble, quabble, quibble, 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 uh, 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 about, you know, when it starts, what it means. Um, uh, others have wrote about the capital scene or the plantation of scene, um, and, and happy to, to go down those pathways. Uh, but, but really this is just a, a way of talking about increasing uncertainty, increasing complexity, uh, increasing uh, interactions uh, across scales, and increasing speed of change. And the degree to which uh, that uh, challenges uh, the ability of our urban systems, and more specifically our, our infrastructures, uh, to be able to continue to provide the services uh, that they're uh, designed uh, to provide, um, and maybe challenges some of the sort of fundamental uh, uh, concepts that they're uh, built on uh, to begin with. And so, you know, you're seeing in terms of talking about cities, increases in urban flooding, uh, increases in urban heat, uh, increased um, wildfires uh, around cities that are increasingly affecting uh, uh, communities and cities, uh, drought, and then you have changing service demands from changing populations uh, ch and changing technologies and then changing values, right? Uh, that, you know, we care more about uh, the ecological systems uh, around, for example, the Los Angeles River uh, than they may have 60 years ago when they decided to channelize it. But yet, that stuff, as we'll talk about, is really operating. It's kind of, you know, even though they're trying to do it right now, and there's a, a bunch of design proposals for restoring the LA River, for example, it takes a lot of money and a lot of advocacy uh, and a lot of political will uh, and resources uh, to be able to change those built systems. And so, the, the infrastructure that we've, that we've built uh, is, is, is increasingly challenged to adapt uh, to, to these uh, changes that we're seeing across the globe. But much of our infrastructure is kind of designed as an infrastructure monoculture, right, for, for delivering a single service. Um, and it's about using technology uh, and built systems to c control complex, often ecological resources, sometimes social resources, uh, to control them within tight bounds to deliver those resources to communities. Um, and infrastructure are inflexible, and not only in terms of institution, institutionally they're inflexible, which we'll get to later, but as uh, Anique Hommels uh, uh, points out in her study of obduracy in the city, that they're obdurate, that is like they're, they're actually physically really difficult to change in addition uh, to, the, to the institutional uh, uh, component uh, uh, on, on top of it. Um, the infrastructure, especially in the United States, are aging and, and in poor condition, right? Um, it's a no surprise, I guess, that the American Society for Civil Engineering continues to give our infrastructure at best a B minus, but more in the, the D to F range, maybe. Uh, but I guess also that keeps civil engineers in business if they, you know, they have to get everything up to an A. Um, so, but there's many reasons for this. Um, you know, our, our, many of our cities, uh, uh, especially in the East Coast, uh, were built uh, a long time ago, and so was the infrastructure that underpins that, right? Um, and those are, those are difficult to adapt. Uh, it takes political support, um, it takes the institutional support, and there are path dependencies involved in there, right? Not only with the physical systems, but the way our institutions manage and maintain uh, those systems, and we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into that uh, later. 
Um, and then, you know, increasingly, as you know, those of you who may do work on the food, energy, water nexus, or or other integrated work like that, um, infrastructure are increasingly interdependent. Yet they're managed as if they were not. You have your Department of Transportation that manages transportation, your Department of Stormwater that does stormwater, right? Um, and and it can be very difficult uh, to get them to. Uh, collaborate uh, uh, in, in different in different places, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so there's a governance mismatch for and, and in terms of uh, you know governing for single use, but yet we know there's all these interactions, both positive and negative, between infrastructure systems. Um, okay. So and when I'm when I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm, I'm a social scientist. I don't really know any engineering at all, even though I was jointly appointed in engineering school in my previous uh, institution, um, <clears throat> but. The way we think about infrastructure in this work and in, in, in the project is not just the built stuff, uh, but it's also the institutional rules, codes, norms, standards uh, uh, embedded in those institutions that design, maintain, and manage that built infrastructure. It's our social norms and expectations about the use of those services and um, the, the, their quality and uh, reliability. Um, and it's the ecological systems uh, that are often controlled by that infrastructure, but also increasingly uh, built into that infrastructure. Um, and there's you know, several of you at LARC that do work on that uh, great infrastructure, for example. Um, and, and, it's, and it's the, the infrastructure you know, also defined as those like backbone uh, systems that make modern life possible. And we often don't recognize uh, or even pay attention to it until they break down in some way. Uh, but when they break down, it's often not just because of something physical going wrong, but it's also something to do with social conditions and or institutional conditions and or ecological uh, variability. And so um, the, the way we began to look at, at sets in this project and through some of the work I'm going to uh, talk about today is, is thinking about infrastructure as an attempt to manage uh, complex socio-eco-technical systems, right? Um, that typically when uh, we, we think of infrastructure and managing uh, uh, stormwater, uh, for, for example, and I'll, I'll come back to that, um, but it's about gray infrastructure, a technological intervention, controlling that natural resource flow. Um, and it's not really thinking about the other potential ecological values that may be embedded in there or the other services that may also be able to be designed into that system, although that is beginning to change. Um, that, that, the, that infrastructure often treats social, ecological, technological domains as, as separate, uh, but yet in the world they're connected and entangled in all sorts of uh, complex ways. And you know, we make the argument, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, that, that um, they, we, we separate those domains to our own detriment, uh, and that we need to have a shift in how we think about how we manage these resources and, and how we think about infrastructure and institutions to enhance resilience. And so uh, I'll try to make this point with a little sidetrack uh, into narrative nonfiction. Um, and so how many of you are familiar with the writer John McPhee? A few, okay. We well, should pick up, get this book. Or just Google Atchafalaya and you'll be able to find the essay that I'm uh, drawing from here. Um, so John McPhee had this great book, uh, 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 the Control of Nature, that looks at, at this case and uh, the confluence of the Atchafalaya uh, and Mississippi rivers, uh, but also looks like at lava flow control in Iceland and mudslides in Los Angeles, and I forget, I think that uh, there might be another case, I can't remember what it is. Um, it just looks at humans and our propensity to try to control complex natural systems, uh, often with disastrous results. Um, and, and so this focuses on the story that's a long one, uh, but he's focusing on events in the, uh, mostly in the 50s and 60s, although there's continual change uh, and completion of some of this work that happened in the, in the 2000s uh, about managing the, the flow of the Atchafalaya and the Mississippi, because what was happening is uh, in this complex river system, uh, the Atchafalaya was getting more and more of the Mississippi River flow, and the engineers did not want the Mississippi River to change course, right? Because uh, that would be bad. It turns out a lot of people that live in the around the Mississippi and out through the Delta, um, and so this was the old river control uh, was an opportunity to uh, control that flow. For nature to take its course was simply unthinkable, and so here you can. I mean, this is you know we don't need to know all the details, but you have the Atchafalaya, you have the Mississippi, and a series of of river control systems to try to control the flow 
of the, uh, from the Mississippi into the Atchafalaya uh, so that the uh, Mississippi uh, would maintain its course. Um, and for those of you, there, is there any, are there any like geomorphologists or hydrologists in the room? Okay, good. Um, uh, so, oh, maybe they'd like this. Uh, because, you know, it turns out the Mississippi River, this is a looking, you know, just a, a little depiction of, of how that river has moved over, you know, the millennia. Um, and, and turns out that it likes to meander a lot, right? That's not super conducive to where humans want to build towns or want to build infrastructure or want to build farms or want to build New Orleans or want to build ports, right? Um, so we can't have that, right? It's got to look something more like this, that we have 600,000 uh, cubic feet per second flowing this way, we're going to have 250,000 uh, cubic feet per second uh, going the other way, right? Um, and so uh, we harnessed it, straightened it, regularized it, shackled it. Um, and that's how you control a complex ecological system. Um, and of course, um, it, you know, it, it sort of works, but there's also, you know, been a lot of flooding, right? Uh, and there continues to be uh, uh, threats from both riverine flooding as well as uh, from storm surges in the Mississippi. Because turns out when you have a lot of uh, river control systems, it also does a, a pretty darn good job of uh, preventing silt uh, to get from getting down into the Mississippi uh, River Delta. And so you have the loss of silt, with, which shrinks the delta, so shrinking uh, uh, the, 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 the wetlands in that area. Um, and then you have some sea level rise at the same time, and then you have storm surges that make their way all the way into New Orleans and, and further, uh, threatening the, all the people and the infrastructure and the communities uh, in the Mississippi River Delta. And so this attempt to shackle it, regularize it, uh, ends up creating a mixture of hydrologic events and human events, it's planned chaos. Uh, that humans, the S part of the, of the sets, right, uh, through our institutions, through our values, through our uh, worldviews, uh, attempt to tightly control the E part of the system, right, through T, through uh, these series of dams and levees and infrastructures um, uh, that leads to the starving of that silt, the erosion of wetlands, um, and to the creation of risk because you're basically creating a system that we would call uh, fail-safe, right? That if the levees or those dams, those river control uh, uh, systems fail, you're in trouble. There's flooding, right? There's not uh, much redundancy uh, built in there. Um, as opposed to other options, which we won't, we won't really get into today, but other folks in the network I've been working on, uh, safe to fail. That what happens if you like are, allow a system to flood and you're able to build the infrastructure and communities and social systems around that, right? And, and thinking about that in different ways. And uh, lest you think that the Army Corps of Engineers has, has learned their lesson, here on the left uh, you have, um, and I forgot to follow, because I read this a few months ago, but I forgot to follow to see what happened, but the, these uh, various colored lines are uh, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, proposed uh, flood walls uh, for Miami-Dade uh, County uh, to, pre to prevent uh, uh, you know, a tidal and storm surge uh, uh, flooding from sea level rise. Um, and not surprisingly, it's received a lot of pushback. Well, why can't we do it in this way and think about more ecological options or more, uh, uh, more dynamic options? Um, and shifting you know, from here to here is not just a, a question of, okay, can we come up with the better ecological designs? Uh, but shifting from here to here also involves thinking about what sort of expertise we value, thinking about how we evaluate risk, thinking about the codes and standards embedded in our institutions that direct how we design uh, technological artifacts. It involves rethinking how uh, the Army Corps or other institutions think about community involvement, how they think about alternative values other than you know, utility or efficiency, for example. Um, and so, in other words, it's a challenge to our governance arrangements and the knowledge systems that we have embedded in those arrangements not just a technical, technical design decision. Um, and so you know, this, is a, you know, this is increasingly important um, as um, uh, you know, just from the infrastructure bill last year, there's gonna be $50 billion, up to $50 billion to protect against droughts and, heats and uh, heat and flood. Um, and then uh, you have the IRA on, on top of that. Um, and, and, and so not only, and this is all about climate adaptation in our, in our infrastructure, but how do we also think not just about the infrastructure, but how are the governance arrangements going to change 
with that influx of, of money, because if not, we're just gonna see more of the same. And so how do you think of both of those at the same time? Um, and so, you know, what I wanna kind of argue here, and what we're, and we're working through this uh, sort of a couple of papers in, in real time here, um, is, uh, in fact, I got, you know, we were working on it before I walked over here, um, is that, you know, this is all symptomatic of being embedded in a paradigm of control where our uh, institutions that design, maintain, manage infrastructure are doing so, uh, thinking about, as I said before, kind of a, a monoculture system. And so, so here, hopefully some of the green infrastructure folks in, enjoy this. I'll add green a little later. But here's just a, you know, a, a regular old stormwater infrastructure, right? Uh, going into the stormwater sewer, uh, runoff on the road, and thinking about the different services, whether you want to talk about ecosystem services or eco-technical services or however you want to put it, carbon sequestration, air quality regulation, habitat biodiversity, thermal regulation, water quality regulation, educational value, aesthetics, those are not important. It's water flow regulation is the, the one thing we're designing for. And that is embedded in all these, I mean, some might say boring, but I think they're exciting, all these uh, uh, codes and standards. And so this is just a quick example of how we design, you know, in some cities, how uh, uh, the pipes underneath that gray infrastructure you just saw, underneath that stormwater drain, are, are designed. How much flow do those pipes that that water is flowing into need to take in order, and hopefully there's no design storm experts, I see people talking about their <laughs> um, uh, uh, How much does it need to be, does, how much flow does it need to take to keep that area from flooding, right? Um, and, and so in the city of Portland, for example, it's designed for a 25-year flood event. So that's the sort of fourth line up uh, from the bottom. This you have, you know, duration, how long it's raining, and this you have the intensity or, or how many inches you're getting uh, per hour. Um, and, and so that uh, uh, design storm standard really uh, uh, is, is embedded in the established level of service that that bureau of, in this case, environmental services, uh, in the city of Portland uh, has to be able to deliver to its ratepayers, right? Um, and, and that 25-year design storm is based on retrospective data, right? That it, it, it's based on what has happened in that system uh, right in the city of Portland. And so it doesn't matter what climate model you give them, how downscaled it is, and we have those, and they're like, this is basically useless because our, the, the way this code, these codes are, or the standard, is designed, it has to be based on that uh, retrospective data because that's how we evaluate risk. And so in order to change how that streetscape looks, in order to change how that, uh, those embedded pipes are gonna look, you have to change how, uh, 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 change those institutional arrangements. Um, and and so, so we're sort of still stuck in this, uh, this paradigm of control. And so this is just another example. This is uh, not far from where I used to live. You know, so you think of infrastructure as this streetscape. What is that designed for? That is designed for mobility, and more specifically, single occupancy vehicle flow, right? So that's how the, the local and state departments of transportation, how they manage uh, flow of traffic and, and how they uh, manage or don't manage thermal regulation, you know, uh, aesthetic value, experience of pedestrians, et cetera. Um, and so this controls per perspective um, uh, it is, is really uh, embedded in a series of assumptions, assumptions which we argue no longer exist. So that the world is stable, like the, the retrospective data on rainfall, right? Like that, that world doesn't really exist anymore. Portland, we know, is going to get more extreme precipitation events, right? For just as one example. Uh, that systems are, are complicated versus, oh, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that later. I won't get ahead of myself. That the events are predictable based on what the world has looked like. Uh, that humans are, you know, separate from nature, that we use our institutions and our technologies to control those resources for uh, utility and efficiency, um, and that's SE&T, social eco-technical systems, uh, are, are separated. Um, and, you know, to get into the weeds a little bit, I think also there's something here about this being embedded in, you know, sort of techno-scientific rationalism, that we're capable of gathering certain knowledge that we can then generate predictions on, um, and that our normative commitments are, are, are relatively narrow uh, in, in how we go about thinking about infrastructure and, the, and what's going to be uh, delivered by it. And so that infrastructure and the institutions that uh, design them 
uh, are not designed for the are designed for conditions that no longer exist. Um, and and so in a in a in a lot of the work uh, in the scenario work I mentioned and in, in other work uh, we're doing with collaborators, we're increasingly exploring this idea of uh, socio eco technical systems and how to move from that control perspective uh, to thinking about the world as rapidly changing to systems that's complex. Uh, that events are uncertain, that humans and nature are inextric inextricably linked. I don't know if there's any Latour fans out there. Uh, Bruno Latour, who just passed away about a, about a month ago, I think this pulls uh, from his influence a little bit, thinking about you know humans, the technologies we create and use, the non-humans that are around us, or the resources, resources that uh, that we interact with are just you know we're all humans. We try through our knowledge and through our value commitments try to separate things in certain ways. Uh, often with uh, disastrous results. Um, and uh, instead of the uh, narrow emphasis on efficiency and utility, uh, thinking about pluralism and diversity and thinking about how these systems are inter interlinked. And so instead of trying to, to separate them and control them, how do you navigate uh, those socio-eco-technical relationships to get to something that's hopefully better, whatever better means, more resilient, more just, more sustainable, um, uh, but but instead of thinking about uh, them as separate, instead of thinking about that our knowledge and our technologies can then control that within very tightly de defined uh, uh, pathways, uh, uh, begin to, to think about them uh, in, in different ways. And so um, what I'm going to get into now as a as a bit of a uh, wait, did I go the wrong way? as a bit of a case study. Um, uh, is uh, just set up a little bit about some of our work on governance and then and talk about uh, some of the work we've done in Portland, Oregon as early ways to begin to think about what needs to change within these institutions to begin uh, to get into some of this. Um, and so hopefully I've sort of underlined this already, but here's the green infrastructure one, right? Uh, getting from you know gray infrastructure, just the focus on water flow regulation to something like green infrastructure, just as an example, that delivers a whole suite of, of services uh, is not just an engineering or an ecological challenge, it's also a challenge of how our institutions value different sets of knowledge and different sets of values um, uh, to, go, to go about their work. Um, and that is embedded kind of within this larger idea of governance, but embedded within our knowledge systems, or how it is that we, uh, the actors in a system, but also we as these institutions, generate, validate, share, uh, and use uh, knowledge and what kind of knowledge um, and, uh, and how that's applied. And so uh, in, in, the, in the governance realm, what we started to ask is how are institutions and governance networks uh, changing uh, to enhance uh, resilience? Because this, you know, this idea of climate adaptation, resilience, uh, especially in the previous absence of any federal uh, regulation, a lot of the work uh, on that was being, is, and was and is being done uh, at the urban scale. And how do changes in governance then open up different uh, possibilities for new types of infrastructure design? And then finally, how can co-production create new ways to think about th those governance arrangements and collaborations um, that then might also uh, provide further fodder for, for transformation? Okay, so. Now I can maybe slow down a little bit, or at least get a little bit down from the clouds to talk about you know specific uh, work that we've done. Um, and so, so um, within this larger network, I was doing a lot of work with colleagues and practitioners uh, in the city of Portland, uh, in Oregon. Um, and and as we began to talk about, okay, what can we do? Like, what are the major resilience-related issues in Portland, uh, and and how can we collaborate to to support and advance that work? Um, and, and we, you know, we, we quickly uh, began to realize, as I mentioned with the design storm standard, there you can see the design storm uh, graph again, um, that, that while maps of urban heat, right, uh, maps of potential urban flooding, all useful, right, but new urban flooding maps are not going to do all that much other than say, hey, we need to change how we think about design storm. Uh, I, showed, I showed this uh, green infrastructure, uh, this bioswale here, um, just as an example of uh, that, um, that the, the city, uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services, which is responsible for most of the green infrastructure uh, in Portland, was trying to collaborate with the Parks Department, for example, um, and they were like, okay, let's build some bioswells and parks, 
Uh, but then the environmental service is like, oh, by the way, people can't use them or be near this infrastructure because this is about water flow regulation and storm water. And we can't use ratepayer money to support aesthetic value, to support thermal regulation for urban heat, for example, when you're looking at streetscape, to support uh, biodiversity and habitat. It has to be about water flow regulation. Um, and then the final piece was working with TriMet and, and PBA, the Bureau of Transportation, uh, um, that, uh, that it turns out a lot of their, uh, the transportation infrastructure for the light rail, but also things as mundane as the, uh, the bus stops, uh, this, that's designed for rain, right? Because Portland gets a lot of rain, right? But that's what most of the stops look like throughout the whole city, especially sort of the, the specific urban heat islands. Doesn't provide much shade, right? And, and so you have, especially in lower income, uh, in underserved communities, longer wait times waiting in places where there's no shade, and we know that Portland has gone from less than five days of 95 plus degrees to like more than 20 uh, over the last five years, right? And so there's some major urban heat vulnerability issues there too. And so they, they, they we, all, we quickly kind of realized that actually what we need to collaborate on is, is not uh, the good old fashioned science, or the good old fashioned science is, is fine, uh, but we need to be collaborating on is how can we, you know, in the, the city infrastructure resilience and recovery group that you see in the middle of this group, DRAG, that became our uh, main partner, how do we work together in the city, let alone across the region? Because I think they, what our real challenge is, is how do we, you know, as we're changing infrastructure in one place, how do we ensure we're working with the community in, right, in the right way? How do we, we know that uh, urban flooding, urban heat's gonna cross, gonna cross all of our infrastructure systems. So we need help on how to collaborate in new and different ways. We need help with how to think about what Portland should do around resilience governance. Um, and so the first thing, how much time do I have left? Uh, it's 4.40 almost. I'm supposed to go to 45? 50. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you a flavor of this, then I'll, then I'll dive into the workshop. So at first what we did, there, we were all like, you know, it'd be really useful to know what other cities are doing in terms of resilience governance. Uh, and so uh, we went out and interviewed uh, 20 chief resilience officers uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, to say, you know, to ask, how are you organizing, you know, your city bureaus around resilience? Like, are you, where are you located? Is it a central office? How are you integrating it across the city? What kind of resources are you getting? What kind of political support and leadership have you had? Um, how are you working with communities? Um, all, all sorts of things. Oh, 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 I actually should jump to the next slide to see you know how 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 this uh, how resilience is is reshaping uh, governance. And then you know for for us it was also then how do you get that back to the partner? How how can Portland think about that? Um, and so we looked at some specific things from the literature. Uh, uh, but we, but we, we also uh, collaborated with uh, the city's chief sustainability officer at the time because they didn't have a chief resilience <laughs> officer yet. Um, what sort of things would you like to know? What would be useful, not just to publish a paper, but what would be useful uh, to actually help Portland uh, do the work on the ground? And so I'm not going to get go through all these because I don't have the time. Um, um, other than to say it was really good and interesting. I'm happy to go back to. Uh, to some of these, but it was really interesting in terms of, I'll just, I guess I'll say a, a couple of things. Uh, just like academics, resilience can mean a lot of things, but that was okay with them, as opposed to us, we like to define it, want to get it specific. Uh, but they actually appreciated that it was able to operate within uh, their context. Um, and, um, and, and, right, so the practitioner is defined for pragmatism, whereas academics try to define for clarity. Um, and, and so, uh, and they all, uh, focused on the the uh, the leadership and having a champion and having a sense of urgency in the city were all really important for for sparking what ended up happening. Um, and an, another, uh, and, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to go through this quick, but also deliver uh, at least something here. Um, Okay, right, so then the other key piece was, okay, if you're gonna do resilience, should it be central? Should it be a chief resilience office with the mayor, next to the mayor, to have that sort of political support and maybe some resources? But then that had a trade off with how well integrated it could be across, uh, across, the, across the city. And it also had issues with, well, what if the mayor changes and you lose that support, right? Um, 
And then if it's going to be uh, sort of more integrated into existing governmental structures, where should that be? Should that be in public works, focused more on infrastructure? Should that be uh, sort of tacked onto environmental sustainability uh, issues? Should that be over in emergency management, right? Um, but emergency management also has some of its own baggage with being more about the response rather than the what can we do ahead of time. Um, and also other things about, about you know, embedded in more sort of military type interventions as well. But this was a key thing that emerged from our partners in Portland, but also uh, from the research that there was trade-offs uh, in, in where that's going to be located um, and needed to be uh, brought to a contextual place. So anyways, long story short, we then you know, use this as a, as a foundation for further co-production and collaboration with the city of Portland, and we delivered this report before we wrote the paper, because it was about responding in real time uh, uh, to this collaboration. And we, and we basically then, based, based on this, we said, okay, let's do a series of, instead of the scenario workshops we had been planning, we let, said, let's dump those overboard, and let's do governance workshops, governance scenario workshops. So how is it that uh, the city of Portland should change the way it works together, uh, integrate resilience, and then also change the way it might work with uh, uh, communities on, on some of these issues? Um, and, and so uh, we, collab we collaboratively produced the, the whole framework and with our partners uh, to really uh, think about, okay, what could different models be? And we worked with a smaller set of partners to, to think about what would be starting points in there, to think about what would be the mission and goals for resilience governance, who are the key uh, uh, actors and uh, organizations that would need to be involved, what would be the actual implementation pathways for getting this off the ground, um, and how would we integrate uh, some of these sort of key findings from the literature and from the work we had done with the chief resilience officers. These are just examples of a couple of cards, you know, a bunch of cards we created on things like diversity and participation. We had stuff on, um, on, on knowledge co-production, on learning and feedback mechanisms, on, on, on flexibility, and, uh, on multi-scale governance. All these cards uh, that were just ways to, to sort of check the group to, to be able to think about um, uh, how these are going to be integrated because we know that these are some successful or, or, or necessary capacities uh, for, for building uh, resilience governance. And, and we had um, different groups focus on good old fashioned centralized model like a chief resilience office. We had a, a more explicitly decentralized uh, model, we had a hybrid model, and then we had a community led model. And that was just what we decided to start off with and then it was whatever the folks generated over the course of two days. Um, and these were folks from all throughout the city, uh, these couple of workshops that I'm talking about. Um, and it was really interesting because they came up with totally different models, different missions, different implementation pathways, different goals. Um, and, and so this is a, a more uh, centralized model where you have a central resilience office uh, that's working with an existing disaster resilience council to then uh, report to the, to the city council. Uh, so a, a little bit more traditional, and then that would be the sort of disaster council be the mechanism for working uh, across the city. Um, and then you had uh, a more uh, decentralized model uh, that would create a city resilience network that would have both uh, members of the community as well as uh, folks uh, from the, the city of Portland, and you'd have resilience teams across every bureau, and you'd have resilience teams embedded in the community uh, that would feed into uh, the City Resilience Network. This was my favorite. This was uh, the hybrid model where they created a fellowship of resilience where they actually buy time uh, from staff. So like really getting into detail. They're like, all these ideas are great, but like I, if I'm not paid to work on this, I cannot. My, my, my supervisor won't let me, for example. Uh, but buying time from key uh, folks in, across each of the bureaus to be part of a resilience and recovery office to ensure that that was integrated uh, across. And this one, we don't have time to get into the weeds, but it was, it, it was a very creative community-led uh, uh, um, uh, approach uh, to integrate community-wide resilience you know, with city and regional-wide resilience, but very focused on uh, community-led uh, priorities uh, working uh, sort of hand-in-hand -hand, uh, uh, with, with the city. Um, and so, where this is at right now is now there is a chief resilience officer uh, in the city of Portland, um, but of course it's underfunded uh, and doesn't really have an office yet. And she was one of the key partners 
uh, in this, and she is in the in, in the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. But they're in the process of now. We're in the process of now trying to sort of think about okay, well, like how do these ideas feed into to what's what's going to continue to be built uh, uh, there in in Portland. These are more sort of things that I'd love to talk about and and think about more. Um, so you know, w one thing as I mentioned. Uh, we eventually got to this question of governance, right, uh, and how to how to think about collaboration within the city, with researchers, with communities, uh, in different ways. That's not the obvious starting point, at least so far in my experience, of where when you when you have discussions with uh, practitioners, uh, it doesn't automatically go there because I think often practitioners, you know, this an academic or researcher is like, okay, can you create a map for me, or like, or what what sort of data can you get for me? Um, but as I said, we sort of continuing the discussion, building that relationship, doing some of that work, right, collaboratively, you know, like making the urban heat island maps, you know, doing the urban flooding, working on climate models, we did all that, um, but, but sort of continuing that uh, relationship to build something that wasn't initially even designed into the proposal or into the early phases of, of, uh, of the collaboration. Um, and, and so I think we, we often tend to think about co-production maybe a little bit more over on this side that okay I have a research idea you know I think the outcome of that research idea would be really useful to a community partner and so I'm going to ask them for a letter of collaboration <laughs> when five days before I have my research proposal due uh, and uh, that that'll be my you know way to collaborate and I think that's maybe a little less true in this community in the LARP um, uh, but uh, and, and that's all fine and good, and I think it can really build trust, and there's, so, so there's things to talk about how that can all help uh, these, other, these other things going on. Uh, but I think if we're going to you know, get to some of these bigger ideas about you know, how do we enhance urban resilience in the Anthropocene, how do we collaborate with partners in a meaningful way that advances uh, you know, their mission and goals and vision, um, how can we even collaborate together to come up with a um, a collaborative uh, sort of vision for uh, for for that partnership, right? Uh, that that takes you know trust. That takes time to develop those more uh, transformative uh, partnerships, and so that's just something we're sort of in the middle of working on and thinking about. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and and then as Camille said, uh, uh, we're partnering on some work, and it's kind of building off some of these lessons that that we learned on on co-production. Um, and some of the lessons we learned about how to think about governance in that space uh, to, to think about how can uh, uh, co-production around governance uh, change collaboration so that different um, infrastructure design possibilities are actually uh, on the table. Because I think what often happens is that there could be some really interesting infrastructure design choice, but if the institutional arrangements are not changing to enable that in some way, it's not going to go anywhere. You come up with the fanciest, most you know, resilient in terms of certain indicators uh, design, but if it doesn't match the context of it, if the institution isn't changing as well, um, uh, that, that that's not going to work. Um, okay, I think that's my awkward conclusion. Um, I just want to thank I just want to thank some key collaborators here because you know, like my name was on the first slide, but this is all like really collaborative work uh, with uh, with practitioners. Uh, in Portland, uh, as well as the researchers, and there's many more, but these are uh, some of the key ones. And so, thank you very much. Nice. Bye.